For those of you who are here for the first time, a very warm welcome to the uh, Buddhist Fellowship. And uh, today is Visat Day, and of course it's an auspicious day. Uh, Buddhists all over the world mark today uh, for three important milestones in Buddha's life. Uh, the first one is the birth of Buddha, his enlightenment, and this Pari Dibbana, that means the passing away of the Buddha. And indeed, it's very fortunate for us to be on this day, Visat Day, to have Ajahn Brahm uh, give us a Dharma talk. Ajahn Brahm, of course, don't need any introduction. So without further ado, I will pass the mic to Ajahn Brahm to give us his Dharma talk. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for coming in here and listening to my talk. When I came down, I thought everybody would be eating, not listening. Because I know what Singaporeans are like. Same with all Asians. Sometimes you arrive late at night. And it doesn't matter what city you are in Asia. There's always some stall selling food. And there's always people eating food. I only have to eat in the morning, I already get fat. I can't understand why you guys don't get fat at all. But outside, we have food for the, the tummy. And in here, food for the heart. This is the food store for the mind in this hall. And even if you eat too much food outside, it may be delicious, but you put on weight and you get fat. But, if you listen to lots and lots of Dhamma, you get a fat heart. A big heart with lots of love and kindness and wisdom. And you can have as much, a bigger heart, the better, as far as we're concerned. So please put on a lot of fat in your heart. <laughs> and in order to get a fat heart, a kind, wise heart which is full of love and kindness, we have to have some wisdom, understanding some of these teachings, and this is not just theory. If you really want to know the science of the mind, you can go to university and listen to a lecturer. But the lecture is usually boring, with no jokes. So here you have a few jokes, because I know I have competition outside. So I have to make some of these things funny. And the nature of the brain, and the nature of the mind, and the nature of consciousness, and the nature of science as well. Sometimes we have to understand this, because sometimes people have got a very poor brain. Sometimes you think they've got no brain at all. Sometimes you think they're stupid. I can tell this joke, because I'm an Australian. You know how Australians, they like to wear these sandals called thongs? You know, just ordinary sandals, just flip-flops they're sometimes called. Very cheap sandals, like you have some there, sir. Would you like to hold up your sandals to show what I mean? Very good. That's right. Now, they're very popular in Australia. And some years ago, there was a, a migrant from Singapore. They went to Singapore and sent their kid to Singapore. Uh, sorry, they came from Singapore and they moved to Australia, to my city of Perth. They moved there because of good education for their kids. And so that one day their child came back home from school and he said, Mummy, 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 what does it mean, IQ, IQ? And so Mummy had to explain to the child, well, IQ is a measure of your intelligence. He said, if you've got an IQ of maybe 120 or 130, you'll probably go to university. If you've got an IQ of 150 or 60, you're really, really smart and probably get PhD. Most of us, we've got IQ of about 100. That's the average, IQ of 100. IQ of about 80, you probably won't finish high school. And if you've got an IQ of about 60, you're so stupid, you won't even be able to tie up all your own shoelaces. And then he said, oh, is that why all Australians wear sandals? <laughs> But that's, that's not why Australians wear sandals. And it doesn't apply to you, sir. I'm sure you've got a very high IQ. 
But it does actually ask us what like intelligence means and what's the brain, what's the mind and what's consciousness. And I love, because I was a scientist, I mentioned last night I liked all psychic things and weird things. And if anyone has any weird stories, I like to listen to those because the nature of science or the nature of investigation is finding out these extreme cases where strange things happen to people and it's those strange cases where we learn about the nature and of the mind and the nature of consciousness and how it all fits together. Now, one strange story which I remember which gives you an indication what this consciousness really is because sometimes people think our consciousness lives in the brain. I know that in Asia we always thought we live in the heart and that's why when they had the first, the very first heart transplant by that South African surgeon, Dr. Christian Barnard. That was in the 60s. People were really concerned. If you have a heart transplant, when you wake up afterwards, who are you? Are you the owner of the heart or are you the owner of the rest of the body? And of course we all know now that it's the owner of the the rest of the body, isn't it? There are some strange stories of people who have heart transplants. Story number one. There was a young girl, a young girl who had a congenital heart defect. So, she had heart transplant. It was the only way to keep her alive but she was only nine or ten years of age, so it was a very traumatic operation. She survived. After many days in hospital, she came home. And once she came home, she started to have nightmares. She had nightmares. She'd wake up in the middle of the night screaming for her mummy, and her mummy comforted her. The strange thing was, it was always the same nightmare. She dreamt she was walking down a dark street and a man attacked her and killed her. She was murdered. Because that was a strange dream and was causing her sleepless nights, The mother went to see the doctor, the surgeon, and reported it. And the surgeon said, Madam, heart transplant is a very traumatic operation. It's just the result of that trauma, just keeping her brain a bit imbalanced. Just wait, the dreams will go away. But the dreams didn't go away. So the mother decided to try another, another uh, area of inquiry. She used some of her contacts to find out, or try and find out, where this heart came from. Who was the original owner? She couldn't find it out from the doctor, but she had some friends in the police force And when she talked to them about the dream her little daughter had, the police got very, very interested. Because all the details of that dream, they matched an unsolved murder case. And the police, they traced the owner of that heart and found it belonged to a woman who was murdered in a dark street. All the details fitted the description of the real murder. And 
because that little girl could give a description of the man she saw in her dream who supposedly killed her in the dream. The police found the suspect. He confessed and he was convicted of the murder of the original owner of the girl's heart. She did have the memories of the original owner of that heart. So, where does the consciousness live? In the brain or in the heart or somewhere else? Story number two. <laughs> this is a very interesting one for you men whose wife is getting a little bit past it. <laughs> if you... Oh, really? Who are you? Goodness gracious. For any of you whose wife is becoming a bit old, listen to this story. <laughs> An elderly woman, a wife, she too had to have heart transplant. And when she came home, as soon as she recovered from the operation, she became what we might call, it's a very sensitive thing for a monk to talk about, let's call it frisky under the sheets. And the husband could not understand the change in her personality. Before she always had headache. Now she wanted to go for it. And he was so, so taken aback by this that he too used some of his contacts to try and find where did she get her heart from. And you know what he found? That heart came from a woman who was murdered. She was prostitute. That's why some of her character from being a prostitute was transferred into that heart and that's what the elderly woman became. Well, not sort of prostitute, but became a bit more frisky. So, if you know, want your wife to change, maybe try to get heart transplant. <laughs> but that really asks the question, where does this mind actually live? I know some scientists think it lives in the brain and there's all sorts of experiments done to try and find the connection between the brain and the mind. Now, because I was a scientist, I know science, and in science, all you need is one experiment, one piece of incontrovertible evidence to disprove all these theories. And there are many pieces of evidence to show that your mind can be totally independent of your brain. Story number one. I got this story many years ago. This was put in a scientific journal, I think Nature, in 1981 almost 30 years ago, there was a professor in Sheffield University in UK, Professor John Lorber. He was investigating the effect the shape of the human skull has on people's intelligence and social, um, social intelligence to see if you had a deformed skull that affected you in any way. Now, if you look at all the people here, your head shapes are all different. Some have got a fat face, 
some got long face, some got ugly face, but we won't go into that today. But some skulls are really abnormal. So he wanted to find out if you have an abnormal skull, how that would affect you. That was his research project. So because he was an expert on skulls, whenever he saw a student actually talking on skulls, I've, we've got a couple of real human skulls in our monastery. I've got one in my room, a real one coming from a dead person, not a plastic one, a real skull. Now, if any of you want security system in your house, something to scare away burglars, forget all this electronic stuff with pin numbers. Burglars can easily overcome that. You get a skull. Get a skull and hang it on a string in front of your door and make sure that as soon as burglar opens the door the first thing he sees is skull! He will run a mile away. That is Buddhist security system. <laughs> Saves you a lot of money and 100% success. <laughs> but, that's why I don't get any burglars. It may be there's nothing to steal in my room, but anyway, there's a skull there as well, which looks as you as soon as you come in the door. But anyhow, he would look at students in his university whose skull was slightly deformed, and he would invite them to go on his research program. He would give them like these MRI scans. He'd give them personality tests. He'd give them questionnaires to try and find out if there was any effect on their personality. One day, one day, he saw this student whose skull was really misshaped, invited him in onto the program, gave him an MRI scan. And then when the result came out, it shocked him. This was a boy who had got, he was a graduate student He'd already got a degree in mathematics, first class with honours. Smart guy. He was doing research. He was well adjusted, had a steady relationship with a girl. He was so normal, nothing wrong with him, except the scan of his brain showed there was no brain there. He became called the boy with no brain. Between his ears was just cranial fluid. No brain at all there. And there he was. A graduate, first class honours in mathematics. But no brain. Can you explain that? It meant you don't need to have a brain to have a mind. Now, I want to do an experiment with all of you. I'd like you all to join in now. Can you move your head back and forth like this? Can you hear any sloshing between your ears? If it is, you've got no brain as well. You've just got water inside, <laughs> inside your brain. Now that, I remember giving a talk on that years ago and after the talk I was meeting a, uh, a he was a doctor, he was a GP and I mentioned that to him and he said Ajahn Brahm that's a very interesting story he said because he was working in uh, Royal Prince Alfred Hospital in Sydney one of the great teaching hospitals in Australia, in Sydney he said I have seen sort of that MRI scan of that boy's brain. It's in our library, we discussed it. It wasn't just done once, it was done two or three times to check there was nothing wrong with the machine. That boy's got no brain, it's weird. And he said to me, you'll never believe just how many problems that's causing you know, in neuroscience. Because that is an anomaly. There's a boy with no brain but he's intelligent. 
and other people have been found the same since. And it starts to ask the question, do you really need a brain to have a mind? Story number two. This happened only five or six years ago. It was reported in the science journals. It was a a poor man in the United States with a brain tumour. A brain tumour is this growth which colonises the cells in your brain. It doesn't eat them, it just takes them over. And as the tumour grows, your brain gets less and less and less until there's no brain left. So this was a slow uh, vanishing of this man's brain. The doctor in charge knew exactly what was going to happen to this guy. As the brain starts to disappear, you start to lose your memory. You start to lose your ability to move your, your limbs. You start to lose consciousness. And last of all, the brain loses the ability to make the lungs draw in oxygen. You suffocate to death. And that was the prognosis. And because you could see the growth of that tumour, it would be several months and there was nothing anybody could do. And as the progression of his death neared the end, he'd been unconscious in a coma for days simply because there was no brain left to open his eyes. All the remaining brain was used just to keep his heart and his lungs going, just to keep him alive. Until there was no brain left even for that. Fifteen minutes before he died, when there was only a tiny bit of brain left, just enough to keep the heart just pumping, with his family around him, waiting for the moment of death as the close family do. He opened his eyes. He leant up from the bed and he had a conversation with his family for 15 minutes saying how much he loved them, how much he cared for them. And after saying his final farewells, he fell back and died. That was totally impossible. He never had a brain to call on to do such things. But there it was. Another occasion of a man, conscious, being able to remember his family, being able to talk to them, but no brain left. Now, It's things like that which tell us perhaps the mind is different from the brain. Story number three. I love these weird stories. These ones you can check for yourself if you like. This was the story of the mind which is still there after you die. I mentioned this in passing last night to explain where ghosts and spirits actually come from. And I mentioned anyone interested in this can get on Google and Google in NDEs and on there you'll find one of my heroes, a Professor Pim Van Lommel, L-O-M-M-E-L, who uh, published a report in Lancet in December 2001 about the survival of consciousness after the brain dies. It was together with his collaborators, Dr. Peter Fenwick and Sam Pani. I think they were from Southampton University. Professor Pim van Lommel, a professor of medicine in the Netherlands, His research project, when he got uh, close to retirement, he, like many doctors, had heard anecdotes of people who died and came back to life again. 
and could recall conversations and events which really happened and they were true. He wanted to put this on a scientific footing to prove it or disprove it. I mentioned this last night, I'm going to go into more detail this afternoon. To do scientific research you have to have your sample group, something which is not biased. He decided he was professor of three hospitals in Holland. He decided to choose every patient who came into all of those hospitals under cardiac arrest. <coughs> bang, bang. That's the ghost again. Now be quiet, even though I'm talking about you. Three who came under cardiac arrest, so in three hospitals. And all of those people, the ones who survived, he'd give a questionnaire to, to see if they had these out-of-the-body experiences, floating out of your body, being able to hear and see everything which went on. And he'd recorded what went on, so he could check if what they were said happened was just fantasy, imagination, or it was real. I love telling these stories. One of my favourite ones was not in his research project, this was in another uh, hospital in London. There was a very wealthy English girl. This English woman, she was only having a minor operation. But even minor operations sometimes have complications and they go wrong. Just to make sure, because she was wealthy, she had a top doctor from Harley Street. Now I should say whenever you pay a lot of money for a private doctor, they are always invariably very polite to you. Yes, madam. Thank you, madam. Well done, madam. But in that operation, in the theatre, on the table, complications. She stopped breathing. Her heart stopped. She died and she left her body and went floating above the table where she could see and hear everything which was going on. But the doctor was panicking. This was a crisis, an emergency. He was about, she was about to die and in the panic he said to the girl on the table, don't give up on me now you bitch. That's what he said. He never realised she was listening. She survived. When he came round for his first visit after her operation, she said, Madam, we came jolly close to losing you that time, in a very polite speech. Yes, but why did you call me a bitch? <laughs> How did you know you were dead at the time? And the moral of that story, if you think someone is dead, be careful what you say. If they come alive again, you'd be in big trouble. <laughs> but Professor Pim Van Lommel, he found many, many, many cases of people who were totally aware. They could record and see real things which happened and they were dead. The machines were on their brain. The brain was not functioning not functioning. In the article in Lancet, Professor Pim Van Lommel went to extreme lengths demonstrating, proving there was no way the brain could be doing anything at the time they saw those things. And it caused a huge controversy. It caused such a controversy that one of the great neuroscientists in Oxford, Susan Blackmore, said, no, this must just be when the brain is about to turn off, when it's about to die, it turns on again. There's so many chemicals which we don't know how they affect the brain, actually uh, secreted at the time of death. This is just fantasy, it's just make-believe. And she challenged them. Can you find, can you find one clear case where a patient who is certainly brain is not operating. At that time, in the middle of their brain being totally 
non-functioning, where they actually remember something which actually happened. So they provided that. A lady in the United States who also, she didn't have a tumour, she had a, an aneurysm in the base of her brain. An aneurysm is a blood cell whose walls are so weak that the, the uh, blood vessel actually expands, it balloons because the, the, um, the vessel is just too weak to hold a pressure. And if it bursts, that's where you have a stroke. Or sometimes the aneurysm is so bad, it kills you. Now, she had this aneurysm. Usually the only way to stop her dying, she could die any time, was to do brain surgery, get to that point, tie up the blood vessel and hope there was not too much damage done to her brain. However, for her, the blood vessel was in the most inaccessible place of the brain, right on the stem. No doctor in the United States dared to operate. No one had ever operated in that part of the brain before without killing the patient. It was too dangerous. But then again, if she didn't have the operation, she would die. She managed to find one doctor in the United States who was pioneering an experimental technique. They didn't know if it would work or not. She had to sign all these forms, these relief forms. Whatever happened, she would not sue. She signed those forms. The procedure was they would freeze her body to such a low temperature that everything would stop. It was like putting her into hibernation, freezing her to such a low temperature. And only when they froze her, so everything stopped, in particular the brain, too low a temperature for anything to work, they would cut open her skull, literally take her brain right out of the skull so they can go underneath, tie up the aneurysm, put the brain back again, thaw her out and hope for the best. That's all it was. They didn't know what was going to happen. They did that. It worked. Pioneering surgery. She survived. She lived to tell the tale of what happened when she was frozen to such a low degree that the anaesthetist who was uh, involved in this research, the anaesthetist said, and he was backed by Sir Roger Penrose of Oxford University. The great, he's the person who discovered uh, black holes. These are top scientists, okay? These are not sort of Jojos in mediocre universities. The anaesthetist said, quite truly, if any, even if one neuron fired during that time, he would see it. The brain was just so dead that not even a neuron fired in that brain. Too low temperature. And she had perfect recall of everything which was done at the time her brain was not working. Again, outside of her body, one of the things which she had was false teeth. Once, she, before she had the skull taken off, they had to take out her teeth. During that time, they had pads over her eyes. The ears were blocked, which is normal in operations. She couldn't see or hear anything, even if she did have a brain working, but she never had a brain. And they put her false teeth in one of the drawers. I think there was about five or six rows, and each row had about eight or nine drawers. She said, Second row down, six one on the right. Perfect recall of details. So it was demonstrated that yes, she was conscious. She had a higher brain function of memory. She could see, she could recall. At a time she had no brain at all. Now that's hard science. To show that your mind is something different than your brain. Sure, your mind makes use of the brain. 
which is why people with, say, dementia, who are so forgetful, like my poor mother in London, I went to visit her last October. She's got dementia. She cannot remember me now. She doesn't know who I am. But one thing I do know, just before she dies or just after she dies, when her mind becomes free from her brain, then she does have perfect recall. Just like that fellow who had the tumour. Because what happens in our normal life is our mind just makes use of the brain. And if the brain does not, is somehow um, traumatized, if there is some disease on there, the mind just cannot sort of manifest itself. But once the mind totally separates from the body at death, then you're free with all your memories and all your characters. It's a time of clarity at the time of death which is why any of you who have read your Buddhist scriptures, you know that time of death is one of the most important times. It's a time when people can become enlightened simply because you've got this great clarity when your mind is at last free, clear, powerful. And that's also what we do when we meditate as well. Because when we meditate, the sort of meditation we do in Buddhism gets so deep, the mind doesn't leave the body, but it separates from the body. Not physically, just like one of my students. This is weird story, I don't know, I forgot, lost count now. One of my students in Perth. He was just an ordinary Caucasian Buddhist. He would meditate maybe for half an hour, 40 minutes at most, but he loved his meditation because it made him peaceful, it gave him some, some clarity and some rest in his life. One Sunday afternoon, there was nothing on TV, so he told his wife, I'm going into my bedroom to do some meditation. If there was a good movie on, he would watch the movie. He wasn't that good a meditator. Except, except this one day. He managed for the first time to do everything correct. After about an hour and a half, he had not come out from the bedroom. So his wife went to check on him. She saw him sitting there, still, perfectly still, too still. She couldn't even see his chest rising and falling. It looked like he wasn't breathing. So what did the wife do? Call the ambulance and the ambulance came as soon as possible. The medics ran into the bedroom. They checked his pulse. No pulse. No breathing. He was dead, so it seemed. So they put him on the stretcher. They wheeled him into the ambulance and at top speed through the suburbs of Perth, going through the red lights, going on the wrong side of the road. It was emergency <laughs> when the ambulance... <laughs> we don't have special effects so I have to make my own special effects. <laughs> As the ambulance sped to the local hospital where they rushed him into the ER room. You've seen it on the TV. People working so fast because every second counts when your heart has stopped. They put on the ECG to see if there was any heart activity. Flat line, ding, 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 emergency, ding, ding, ding. It doesn't go ding, 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 but it's a good line for me to actually make it a more interesting story. Ding, 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 emergency, heart failure, ding, ding, ding. A flat line. They put the EEG on him, which sees if there's any brain activity. Ding, 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 emergency. No brain activity. No heart activity. For most people, if you go into hospital like that, after five minutes you go down to the morgue. You're dead, mate. That's it. Gone. However, 
It was a very good job they never sent him down to the morgue. He was only meditating. Imagine what would have happened. Because later he came out of meditation. If they sent him down to the morgue and he was flat on the stretcher and then he came out of meditation, where am I? He would have killed the morgue attendants of fright. And the only reason they never sent him down there was because the doctor on duty that day, this was very lucky, the doctor on duty was an Indian man. You know, migrated over to Australia and he had heard from his parents that sometimes these yogis can get into such a deep state of meditation that they can suspend all their life activities. And the doctor knew from his wife, he was a guy who had been meditating. So he decided to put defibrillators on him, electric shocks, to see if they can get the heart going. Many, many times they put the electricity through his body. He jerked off the table. Nut. Just like that. But nothing worked, nothing worked. <laughs> Until he just, he told me this. He said he just decided it was time to come out from his meditation. He opened his eyes. And as soon as he opened his eyes, beep, beep. It actually does go to that, beep, beep. The EEG was perfect. The ECG was perfect. He was completely healthy. The doctor was stunned but gave him a quick uh, check-up. Everything was normal. In fact, it was so normal, the doctor said, just go home. And he walked home with his wife. During that whole time, he was perfectly aware, conscious, mindful, but not of his body. He couldn't feel the defibrillators. He couldn't hear the sound of the, the siren of the ambulance. He was deep within, having the most wonderful experience of his life. He went to what we call in Buddhism the realm of the mind, into the jhana realms. Just pure mind. And the body was just left behind for a while to come back to later. Totally safe, totally healthy, no problem whatsoever. That's more evidence of what can happen. The mind is independent of the brain and the body, which is why when your brain stops, when it stops once and for all, when you die, your mind will carry on. It's independent. So the mind is much, much bigger than your brain. The mind is certainly not, according to science, some side effects of your brain. And again, if you don't believe me, <laughs> you will when you die. <laughs> you will still be aware, which explains all these ghosts and other things which happen. These are true stories which many of you have experienced. So when we understand the mind is actually separate from the body and the brain, it means that as far as religion is concerned, it gives us a different way of understanding the world. First of all, if you know what the mind is and you know how it's different than the brain and the rest of the body, first of all you know that this life is just one amongst many your mind will just go on. Seek for another life. For any of you who have got children, young children, especially mothers, I'm talking this about Australian mothers. Many say this. I've never given birth myself. Actually, I have, but not in this life. <laughs> but, when you give birth to a kid, and you look at that kid, that is not you. That is not your husband. That is another being who's come into your life. Someone with history. Someone you have to learn who this person is. They are not some Xerox copy of you and your husband. 
they're a separate being. And people have told me these great stories of kids when they first come out of the womb. This one Australian girl told me this story and it spooked her, it freaked her out. She'd just given birth a couple of days. In the hospital the baby was sucking from her breast. She was lying on her back with the baby on her tummy. When the baby finished feeding, the baby just moved away from the breast, sat on her chest, crossed its legs in the full lotus position, put the right hand over the left hand and closed its eyes. The baby was meditating. And that spooked her, that's why she came and saw me. What the hell's going on? Babies don't know how to cross their legs in full lotus. Perfect posture. Who taught the baby that? Of course, that came from the baby's previous life. Just had its lunch, now wants to meditate. Just like good monks do. <laughs> now that actually explains so many things about you know, where these beings come from. You cannot explain just the intelligence of some of these prodigies, the ability of kids to do this when their brain is hardly formed yet. Even all more weird stories to just show that when a baby is born they've got a mind which is sometimes stronger than their brain It can do things that physiologically you're not allowed to do such as speak I've counted three, three examples people have told me about kids, babies come out of the womb who can actually speak. The first time there was a Malaysian couple who lived in Perth. Oh no, sorry, this is wrong, that was the second couple. The first couple was Caucasian couple. They came to see us because they heard something which really shook them. They had two children, Peter and Paul. Paul was the, um, Paul was the uh, older kid, maybe about three years of age or two years of age, could speak. Peter, he was just born, maybe a week or two weeks. They'd just come out of hospital. They were at home. The little baby... So Peter was in his um, cot or whatever you'd call it. And it was time for Paul to go to bed. Mummy said, Paul, say goodnight to your brother Peter and then go to bed. So Paul leaned over, leaned over his newborn brother and said, goodnight Peter. And Peter said, goodnight Paul. The parents, they couldn't believe what they heard. Two-week-old babies can't speak. They stopped what they were doing and they stared in disbelief. Did we really hear this? And without any prompting, their elder son said again, Good night, Peter, to his baby brother. And this time, with both of them listening, focusing, alert, they saw their newborn son, only two weeks old, open its mouth and clearly say, Good night, Paul. And they couldn't get to the monastery quick enough to say, What the hell's going on? What's happening? And of course, it's just the baby has been reborn. In those first years or first weeks of life, your mind is actually more powerful than the brain that can do such things. I said the second occasion was a Malaysian couple. They said we didn't want to tell anybody because they, we thought that people would not believe us, that we were mad. But the best story of all came from the United States where, and this is very, very Buddhist, when this being came out of the mother's womb, the midwives, the doctor was there because it was born in hospital, and the baby came right out of the womb, I think the umbilical cord was still on, looked around and clearly said, everybody could hear this, oh no, not again. <laughs> Imagine being reborn again. 
You know, having to wear nappies again. Having to go to school again. You thought you finished school. No, maybe you have to do it all over again. Oh no, not again. <laughs> so that is actually some nice evidence of showing how that, yes, there are things which are really weird and strange. The mind is something quite different than the brain. And the consciousness, the manifestation of the mind is really strange and weird. This is the heart of what you take yourself to be. So it's great to understand it because that will change much of your attitude towards life, towards death, to all these important things which sometimes create so much confusion and also suffering in life. If you understand what mind is and it continues on after you die, why are you so upset when your mother dies or your father dies? They're not really going anywhere, they're not disappearing. They're just taking a break, that's all. Taking time out, taking the great big holiday, the real vacation. So you don't have to worry when somebody dies. It's not if they die, it's how they live which is important, not if they die. So understanding the nature of the mind and the nature of the brain and the nature of consciousness, and I mentioned much science today, but all that I've said today, I've mentioned science, but you can find all of that in the teachings of the Buddha. Actually, that's what the Buddha taught. But sometimes, because it's in an old text and because the Buddha is a long time ago, people will think, oh, maybe that's not true. That's why you have to use science to back up the fact that your brain is important but not necessary. Your mind is something which is more important than your brain. Understanding that, make sure you cultivate a good mind, a positive mind, a pure, kind, generous, unselfish mind because that you carry with you for many more lives to come. That's your investment in the future. The big investment, not just in this life but for future lives. That's why we have religion. That's why we have meditation. That's why we have doing good, kind, generous things. And especially on Waysack Day. Whenever there's a holiday over in Australia, the policemen, they have what they call double demerits. If you get caught speeding or going through a red light, you lose twice as many points you know, towards, if you lose about, I don't get it, 15 points, you lose your license. But if it's on holidays, they double the demerits, they double the fine you have to pay. It's called double demerits on holidays, on religious days. And the same goes for charity and goodness. On Waysack, it's double merits. You get twice as much good karma for every dollar you put in the donation box. You get twice as much good karma for every act of kindness you do. You get twice as much good karma for every act of compassion you do on today. Because Waysack Day is double merit day. <laughs> I'm just encouraging you to do good things today. So that is the talk on the brain, the mind and consciousness with some stories which I hoped you found interesting or at least strange. So now is the time for some questions and I hope to have some tough questions from you. Good morning everyone. Sorry if I come looking a bit painted today. <laughs> I just got uh, dragged to uh, get my face painted so and I cut cue but it also meant that I paid twice as much as everyone else. Uh, anyway, it's good fun to uh, do something different on Vesak Day. And there's a stall there that's uh, selling the tickets. So uh, do support. 
as many of the stalls are set up by the members and lovingly, all the foods are lovingly cooked by the parents or themselves and, and really put in the hard work this morning. They were here setting up the uh, stalls till about one o'clock this morning. So you can do your bit by consuming some of the food or buying some of the things back and getting your children to uh, participate in the games. Later, uh, after the talk, we will be having the, uh, taking the refuge ceremony. And those of you who will be taking the refuge uh, can collect a certificate that's signed by Ajahn Brahm, which you can put your name to it to commemorate your special uh, act today uh, in order to observe the five precepts and to take the refuge in the Buddha Dhamma Sangha. So now I'd like to open the floor for questions. So if any one of you have a question, you can uh, request for a microphone or you can ask one of the volunteers to bring the uh, question up to me. And while we're waiting for the first question, I'll say something about the food stalls. Because it's Waysack Day today, and because whatever food you eat today is for charity, it means that you can eat oily food with lots and lots of sugar because the good karma you make will balance the extra cholesterol and will balance the diabetic effect of all that sweet. So you don't have to worry about cholesterol, you don't have to worry about diabetes, you don't have to worry about things because that's all balanced by the good karma today. So you can eat as much as you like with a clear conscience because it's good karma. And if you do die, never mind, you go to heaven. Just today. <laughs> okay, uh, dear Ajahn Brahm, there's a Straits Times article that talked about someone trapped in a paralyzed body and unable to communicate for 23 years after a car accident. Uh, sorry. Yes. His mother refused to give up hope and spent long years looking after him and looking for doctors who can help his son. Her efforts finally paid off when her searching got in touch with the Dr. Lores, a Belgian neurological expert who put him through a PET scan two years ago and found that his brain was still functioning almost normally. What is your take on this, especially with regard to the brain and the mind? That's brilliant because I read that article as well. It was very innovative. You know, they could do the, um, the PET scan of the brain, certain parts light up. And I think if there was um, a spatial um, thought in his mind that one part would uh, light up, if it was more um, an intellectual thought, another part would light up. So they had a yes, no, yes, no signal by looking at different types of his brain. For yes, he had to imagine like fields, which was a spatial. I think it was uh, a no, they had to imagine something like a some numbers or something which was uh, a different part of the brain lighting up and that's actually how they could communicate with him his mind was perfect but he just didn't have the means to communicate you know what he was thinking and so he, they actually opened up lines of communication to him and that is classic his mind was fine his brain was stuffed and just because this very, very smart neurosurgeon managed to find a way of uh, him signalling just through thinking what was going on in his mind to get a yes, no, yes, no, yes, no uh, way of communication. Brilliant mind, hopeless brain. A good example that even if a person is uh, in a coma, if their brain is not functioning, but in this particular case they realise parts of his brain were functioning. The part of the brain which is knowing was functioning but he couldn't communicate back. So it was like a one-way brain. You can receive information but you couldn't actually uh, respond. But they found a way of responding. And because of that now they have new tests to find out if a person really is dead, really is in a vegetative state or just in a comatose state. Ajahn Brahm, is consciousness and the mind the same? Hello. Is consciousness and the mind the same? Now, in Singapore you followed mostly a Western system of education based on Western philosophy. For those of you who've studied Western philosophy, if you go as far back as Aristotle, 
one of the founders of Western philosophy, he too mentioned six senses, not five senses, six senses. The five senses of seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching and the sixth sense was mind, mind consciousness. And he called mind consciousness the common sense. He called it common sense because everything you see, hear, smell, taste and touch the mind also knows. Somehow, and I'm not sure why this happened or when this happened, in Western culture we lost one of our senses. We lost our sense, we lost our mind. And that's why Western culture stuffed up much of the world. We lost the sixth sense and we lost this idea of common sense of the mind. Now, we all know, we should know that there are six senses. The mind is a totally different sense. It's a consciousness, mind consciousness. Now, the way this works, this is exactly how the Buddha described it and this is what you see in meditation. You have those five senses. Suppose you see something. That's called sight consciousness. It's usually immediately followed by mind consciousness. You know you've just seen something. You know you've just heard something. You know you've just felt something. What actually happens is two different types of conscious activity go on there. You see and then the mind knows it sees. For knowing, some philosophers have said the proof of self, of a self-consciousness is you know that you know. Now, as a meditator, as a Buddhist, I can see the error in that. The error is not including that small moment, that small time delay. If you're being accurate, you never know that you know. You know that you knew. There is a time lag. You know something and then you know that you knew. And that makes a totally different philosophy where the idea of a permanent self is no longer necessary. I'm being quite sort of um, uh, quite clear here, quite precise. In particular, I'm going to go a little deeper now for you on Waysack Day. That sixth sense, mind consciousness, because it is the common sense, it is the most important of all the senses, the mind. And those five senses, they can stop, they can die either on the operating table when you really are dead after you, this life is finished or in deep meditation you can stop those five senses and just have the sixth sense happening. And this is where you really know what the mind is, what mind consciousness is. I have given a simile, the simile of the emperor. Imagine there was an emperor, a very, very powerful being who really affects your very life and your existence and your happiness and what you do from day to day. This is the most powerful emperor. Trouble is, you never see who that emperor really is. Because that emperor, whenever that emperor appears in front of you, he's wearing these big boots, these thigh-high, I saw in the newspaper, gladiator boots. That's a, is that right, fashion? Thigh high gladiator boots which go right up to your up to your thighs. Big trousers which cover the top of his uh, boots and go up to his waist. A jacket which overlaps the top of his trousers, goes high to his neck and to his wrists. Big gloves which overlap the bottom of his sleeves. And lastly, a helmet which covers his head and overlaps the top of his jacket. So all the pieces of clothing overlap each other so you cannot see any part of the emperor's body. You don't know if it's a man, a woman or gay. You don't know whether it's Caucasian, um, African, Asian or Eskimo. You don't know who it is because you can't see them. 
And if you really want to find out what that emperor is, you've got to take all the clothes off to see what's underneath. Is it a girl or boy, old or young, what race? In that simile, the emperor stands for your mind. Your mind, your mind consciousness, which is the most important part of you. That's your emperor. But unfortunately that emperor is always covered up with the five pieces of clothing with seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching with the five senses. And the job of Buddhist meditation is to take off those five senses, to subdue them, to quiet them, to calm them until they disappear, until all that's left all that remains is your mind, your mind consciousness. That's what we monks do. That's what you do in meditation retreats. Come face to face with your mind, the emperor, to find out who's running the show. Who is this person inside of you called the mind? What is it? How does it work? So as a meditator, I do that experiment. Go so deep in meditation, there's the mind and that's all that's left you get to know it and understand what it really is. Now one thing, when you get into these states, we call them the jhanas, pure mind, no body. That's what that man got into, went to hospital. Totally safe, you don't have to worry about anything. If you get into those pure states of the mind, one thing which is very clear to you is that this mind has got nothing much to do with the body. So when you die, you know what's going to happen to you. People who go into deep meditation have no more fear of death because they know what happens. You've got direct personal experience again and again and again what it's like to be dead. Which is just means having a mind but no five senses, no body. And I guarantee you, I can say this you know, with full honesty, death is nowhere near as bad as you think it's going to be. It just needs a PR makeover. You shouldn't really cry when someone's died dead. Hey, wonderful, you're free at last. So next time someone dies, don't cry, have a party. Okay? <laughs> so if you haven't signed up for the meditation retreat that we're holding in Chiang Rai, there are some spaces left for the uh, retreat from the 16th to the 20th. And you can get a very special fare from Silk Air now for only $313 inclusive of taxes. So, another good reason to go. Dear Ajahn, if we re can recall perfectly after death, why can't we recall our past lives in this life? How many of you can remember your, the early years of this life? Your first six months. Can you remember that? The reason why you can't remember that is such a long way away. Your memory is not that good. So if you can't remember your first six months, how do you think you can remember your previous life? You can if you train yourself. And that's one of the other things we do in meditation. We train ourselves to remember our early life and our previous lives. And the space in between that, it can be done. It's stored in your mind, but it's not stored in your brain. That's the trouble, because your brain's a new brain. And if your memory, if you use a memory which relies on your brain, of course you can't even remember the early months of your life because the brain wasn't properly formed then, it was still growing. So it wasn't truly sort of, um, what you might call, it wasn't sort of booted up properly yet. All the software wasn't in place. Now you accumulated that in your first years of life. No wonder you can't remember if you use your brain to remember. But once you get a strong mind, strong mind in meditation, that's what it does. It's like uh, exercises. Exercises in the gym give you a strong body. Exercises in meditation give you a really powerful mind. When you have the powerful mind, then you can remember your early life and your past lives. As many people do. If you come up to the retreat in Chiang Rai and you really get into it, that's what happens to you. Now you can find out what you were before. I'm not saying who you were, what you were. You can find out 
the early years of your life. Again, I, sometimes I feel constricted by the rules which are put on, put on me, but I respect those rules, I have to keep them. Unfortunately, I can't tell much about my previous lives. It's supposed to be something I'm not supposed to tell anybody. So what I do to get around that, I tell the early part of this life. This is like a loophole in the Vinaya, the rules I have to keep. Once, years ago, deep meditation, come out afterwards. I don't know where I got this idea from, but it's how it works. I ask, what is my earliest memory? So you try that. If you have a deep meditation, I mean really deep meditation, ask that question. Just a suggestion to the mind, not repeated, just said once, what's my earliest memory? If your mind is strong, empowered, you will get a very early memory. It seems to be, this is just from my experience, experience of teaching others, usually an early memory from this life. For me, it was me and my baby's pram. You know the pram which you know, your mum used to um, push you around in in those days? How it happened to me, I can do this without breaking my rules. How it happened to me, was my earliest memory, the next moment I had a smell in my nose. It was nothing to do with where I was. This was a smell which was totally independent of my surroundings. And I recognized that smell immediately. That was the smell of my baby's pram. And with that recognition, I was, my eyes were closed in meditation, I was back in my pram. Reliving an experience as if you were right there. Clear, being able to move around, explore my surroundings. I was back as a baby, maybe, I don't know, three, four, five weeks old. And I could recognize all these old memories of an early part of my life which I could not recognize, I could not get to by using my brain, but I can get to by using my mind. That was the first time I had such an experience. And when I talked about it with other people, one interesting thing was when I talked with you know, doctors, especially gynecologists, they told me that that's fascinating that it was the smell which you recognize because in the physiologic, physiolo, physiological development of a newborn infant, the smell, the sense of smell develops first of all. That is the dominant smell, tells you the dominant sense for a newborn baby. Now our sight, and maybe our sound is a close second, these are our dominant senses. Now for dogs, their dominant sense is a smell and also for infants. And I know that as personal experience, I know that smell is how a baby recognizes their world. They recognize their pram, their mother, their toys by their smell. And when you've gone back to that state, you notice how true that is. That's not just theory anymore, that's your direct experience. And so I tell this, if there's any young mothers here, or if you're thinking of having a baby, or about to have a baby, for the first few weeks of your baby's life, please do not change your perfume. You'll confuse the hell out of your kid. They won't know who they are. <laughs> they recognize you by your smell. So don't change. <laughs> so that's actually how it happens and that's how you remember. And it's fascinating to do that and to find out this is not theory anymore, this is reality. You can access a type of memory bypassing your brain. Ajahn Brahm, you mentioned that consciousness continues to exist even after death. In life we often meet with people we seem to have special bonding or connection with. Does this mean that we were related to these people in the past lives? Yes, of course it does. You know, there's a lot of people that when they die, they haven't had enough of each other yet. You know, they really are still in love, they still like each other, they still want to be around each other. And that karmic force of craving, that will bring you together again for another life together. I don't know how many times I've seen that happening. Sort of lovers part through death and they come back again. And when it happens, it's called love at first sight. It's not at first sight, it's here we go again. 
And on the opposite, sometimes you meet someone you feel really uncomfortable with them. You feel you want to get out of the room. And again, that's hate at first sight. <laughs> if it's not at first sight, you remember what they did to you last time, so you want to get out quick. But that love at first sight is actually true. One of the great examples of that, and this is a crazy story, but I love this story, one of the uh, most stable marriages in Hollywood is between John Travolta and his wife Kelly. Kelly is an Australian girl and she mentioned in an article how she met the love of her life, her husband, John Travolta. She met him at a movie theater in Adelaide. He was just a face on a poster. She was going to the movies with her best friend, her girlfriend. She was about, I don't know, 18, 17, 16 or something around that. When they walked to the movie, it was Greece. There's a big picture of the movie star John Travolta and Kelly turned around to her best friend pointed at him, just a face on a poster, that's the guy I'm going to marry. <laughs> it was a crazy thing to say. You know, this was a big Hollywood movie star. She was just an ordinary girl in Adelaide. But she knew that was the guy I'm going to marry. And of course they did, and they've been married happily for many, many years. Well, that was an extreme case of love at first sight. You just see a photo of your wife or your husband-to-be. And that's it, you know that's going to be them. And many people have told me that. They've seen a person a long distance away. I'm going to marry that guy. And you know it's true. It's scary, it's spooky, but you know and it happens. Of course it can only be explained by it's just carrying on from a past life. Here we go again. So isn't it romantic? Don't worry that your husband or your wife dies, we'll meet again on some street. I will pick you out from the crowd and I will know that's her. Here we go again. Is that romantic? <laughs> Look, I'm not very good. I'm good at doing ghost stories, but I'm a monk. I'm not very good at doing romantic. <laughs> he doesn't believe in it. <laughs> Is there such a thing as the group mind and what happens to the mind when it enters Nibbana? Okay, a group mind, not really, because we're all individuals, but sometimes we can give up our consciousness to the group consciousness. You see that happen, say, in soccer stadiums, when people go crazy, or in big protest movements like red shirts in Bangkok where people get caught up in a group craziness. It's not really a group mind, you let yourself get caught up in that. So, as someone who's a meditator who trains their mind, you don't get caught up in anything you don't agree with. You can actually step out of that. That sort of that group mind stuff, most psychologists know, you know, the sort of the group consciousness which can happen in a huge group of people, especially when they get emotionally excited and they can do things they would never do by themselves. And that's really, really dangerous sometimes. But really, that it only shows a weakness of mind that you get into that group consciousness. So really, that you should really be mindful enough not to be swayed by others, but to be strong, to be independent, to make your own wise choices. Because that really is the nature of the mind. You can let it go and join in with others, but it's not a very good thing to do. What happens to the mind in Nibbana? Poof! It disappears. Gone forever. But, how the heck can you think can understand that? The only way you can understand that is see the mind, what it really is, into the deep meditations and see it vanish and disappear. Poof! The great vanishing trick gone into the great emptiness, nothingness, peace at last. But I don't expect you to understand that. 
Never mind. You have the answer. That's why, that's why one of the great experiences I have with my master, Ajahn Chah, I won't go into great detail because I'm running out of time, but once I'd just come out of a deep meditation, he saw I was clear, ripe to be enlightened. I was going to pass him on the path in our monastery and he looked at me fiercely and said, Brahmawangso, why? He asked me the question, why? The deepest question of our universe, why? And this was coming from one of the great meditation masters of our age, a great enlightened one, Ajahn Chah. He asked me, why? I considered deeply and I replied, I don't know. <laughs> I was only a young stupid monk. And anyway, young stupid monk, I said, I don't know. He laughed. Enlightened people, when you're stupid, they think it's really, really funny. They never get scold you, they just laugh. They think it's hilarious how dumb these Cambridge graduates can be. <laughs> but then, he was serious again. He said, Brahma Wangso, I will tell you the answer. I will tell you the answer to the question why. This was coming from a great Arahat enlightened being. The answer to the question why. You want to hear it? Really? The answer to the question why? There is nothing. There is nothing. That's his answer to the question why. And he looked at me and he said, Do you understand? Bama Wangso, do you understand? I said, Yes. He said, No, you don't. <laughs> so that's the answer to the question why. There is nothing. Do you understand? No, you don't. Okay, and the last question before we move to the refuge uh, blessing is uh, in the Abhaya Sutta it says that in the case of words that we know to be non-factual, untrue, unbeneficial but endearing and agreeable to others, we do not say them but you encourage flattery. So please explain the contradiction. Okay, the flattery is useful. You've got to live with each other. So in that particular sutta you say, if it's just endearing, nice words, but it's not of benefit, then no need to do it. But you'll find that words of endearment, kindness, are beneficial. They are useful. You have to live with your husband for a long time. I already mentioned, maybe a few more lifetimes. You've got to put up with him. So, do a little bit of praise, a little bit of endearment, because the Buddha also said, right speech, this is part of the Eightfold Path, should always be words which are, are kind, meaningful, which uh, go to the heart, which are soft on the ear. It's wonderful words of advice from the Buddha. You don't need to shout at someone to get, you, get them to do what you want to do. If you want to know how to control your wife and get her to do what you want to do without her knowing what you're up to, you can come to me, Buddhist Psychology. I should write a book about this. How to influence your wife without her finding out. <laughs> and it works. You don't need to shout. You don't need to scold, endearing, it just gets right in her. You're so beautiful, darling. You're so wonderful, darling. I'm so lucky that I have found you and you've chosen me. I'm so lucky. You soften her up until she becomes so malleable like a nice piece of clay. You can get her to do whatever you want to. That's how it works. <laughs> Thank you, Ajahn. Uh, for those of you who are provoked by what Ajahn talked about in terms of where the mind goes when it enters Nibbana and the common sense of the mind, what actually happens to it when we meditate, the best thing you can do is to come for the meditation retreat and come for the silent part 
not the part that you talk, because it's when you're really silent for five days and you don't speak to anyone that you really begin to understand your mind better. It also transforms us because we appreciate silence. I remember going for my first nine-day retreat of not speaking. I thought it was going to be torturing, but it turned out to be the best holiday I've ever had. So I highly encourage you to try it. And even though you think you talk a lot and you need to talk, you'll be amazed at yourself at how much you appreciate the silence that you never knew was beautiful. So do sign up. I think we do have spaces left between the 16th and the 20th to Chiang Rai. So with that, uh, we'd like to conclude this morning's uh, session. And we would um, so first of all, let's put our hands together to thank Ajahn Brahm.